And I want to begin reading in Acts chapter 10, verse 34. Acts 10, verse 34. And we're going to read uh, several verses. Acts chapter 10, verse 34. And this morning I'm reading from the New International Translation of the Holy Scripture for those of you who carry that particular translation. Acts chapter 10, look at verse 34. Then Peter began to speak. I now realize how true it is that God does not show favoritism, but accepts men from every nation who fear him and do what is right. You know the message God sent to the people of Israel telling the good news of the peace through Jesus Christ, who is Lord of all. You know what has happened throughout all Judea, beginning in Galilee, after the baptism that John preached, how God appointed Jesus, or anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and power, and how he went around doing good and healing all who were under the power of the devil because God was with him. We are witnesses of everything he did in the country of the Jews and in Jerusalem. They killed him by hanging him on a tree, but God raised him from the dead on the third day and caused him to be seen. He was not seen by all the people, but by, but by the witnesses whom God had already chosen by us who ate and drank with him after he rose from the dead. He commanded us to preach to the people and to testify that he is the one whom God appointed as judge of the living and the dead. All the prophets testified about him that everyone who believes in him receives forgiveness of sins through his name. While Peter was still speaking these words, the Holy Spirit came upon all who heard the message. The circumcised believers or Jews who had come with Peter were astonished that the gift of the Holy Spirit had been poured out upon even on the Gentiles, for they heard them speaking in tongues and praising God. Then Peter said, can anyone keep these people from being baptized with water? They have received the Holy Spirit just as we have, so he ordered that they be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. Then they asked Peter to stay with them for a few days. May our God's rich blessing be to his word. May be sanctified in our hearts. Let's bow for prayer. Father, we thank you for your word, for its entrance gives light to us. And to speak to us that we might see Jesus and all of his transcendent power and glory. For it's in his name we pray and give thanks. Amen. You may be seated in the presence of the Lord. I want to speak to you this morning from the subject of two unlikely brothers. Two unlikely brothers. I was in a meeting on yesterday, and there was a young lady there who gave a, a presentation uh, to this group. And after she had given the presentation, she and I was talking out in the hallway, and some people were there standing, and I said, this is my cousin. And everybody looked at me kind of strange and crazy. And uh, Sister Misha, you was there, and I'm talking about Tracy Chapman. Uh, Tracy Chapman, she's my cousin. And if you were to look at us, you wouldn't think that we would be cousins uh, because she looks like she's Caucasian. And they thought I was trying to be funny, <laughs> but she's my cousin. Her, her father and my mother actually were first cousins. And so people kind of made little jokes about it, and, uh, and someone said, y'all are unlikely cousins, you know. And I said, well, somewhere along the line, we all cousins, you know. <laughs> you want to know the truth about it, but we can all trace our heritage and our lineage back to the first parents, to, to Adam and Eve, so we all are related. And sometimes through this life, we encounter people that we connect with, we bond with, we build relationships with and friendships with, and we have fellowship with, we might appear to be quite opposite, unlikely to be friends, unlikely to become brothers and sisters in Christ. And I think this particular chapter, Acts chapter 10, show us how that in the miracle of salvation, God can bring people from diverse and sundry backgrounds, reconcile them to himself through faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, and then reconcile them to each other and create this new body that we know as as the church. The book of Acts, this marvelous book here in the New Testament, is a very important book to the New Testament canon because as I shared with you before, the book of Acts helps us to understand how did the Christian faith, how did the message about Jesus Christ 
get from Jerusalem, this little small city in Israel? And how did it get to the entire known world in less than 30 years? How did that happen without telephone, without telegraph, without tell Tom Tolliver? How could it happen? How could it happen without a computer, without the internet, without cyberspace, without the type of uh, transportation that we have today? How could the message about a simple carpenter, an itinerant preacher of no means, of no house, high stature, how could this message permeate the known world in less than 30 years? The book of Acts helps us to understand that. It helps us to understand how these early disciples, these followers of Jesus, these men and women of the way, these Messianic Jews, took seriously the mandate that had been given to them by their teacher and their Lord, Jesus Christ, to tell people, one person at a time, two people at a time, several people at a time, whole groups of, whole groups of people, and how this gossiping of the gospel continued from village to village, place to place, and eventually the message had reached uh, to every corner of the world. Well, I want to look at a couple of things this morning before we observe the Lord's table from Acts chapter 10, because Acts chapter 10 is very important in the book of Acts because it shows how the gospel spread to the non-Jewish community. Now, I'll share with you in previous weeks, most of the early followers of Jesus, they had been Jews, and they became Messianic Jews, and they believed that Jesus was the Messiah. And they believed that the Messiah was coming only for the Jews, and they saw the Messiah as a parochial Messiah. There was one just for the Jews. Now, there were non-Jewish people that would become Jewish proselytes. They would convert to Judaism. And that was a very, very difficult process to do. And if a person was a male, they had to be willing to submit uh, to the rite of circumcision before they will be received into the Jewish community as a true Jewish proselyte, and then they would have to follow all the dietary laws, the ceremonial laws, and keep the feast. And there were some Gentiles that would do that, and they would then be brought into the Jewish community as Jewish proselytes. But there were other people who believed in the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. They believed that he was the true and the living God but they were not willing to make this commitment to abandon their culture and to immerse themselves in Jewish culture, and if they were men, to submit to the right of circumcision, but they still believed in and followed the Jews' God, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and they would go as far to attend the Jewish synagogue and, and study the scripture. And many of them became known as God-fearers. They feared the true God, they were god fears they were not full Jewish converts to Judaism. And so as we open up Acts chapter 10, we know that Peter is at a place called Joppa, and that's where we found, left him last week. And he's come to a place called Joppa, and he is led by God to remain there several days, and he resides as the house of a man by the name of Simon the Tanner. So as Acts chapter 10 opens up, Peter is at the home of Simon the Tanner. But the scene of the scripture goes to a place called Caesarea. And we're introduced to a man by the name of Cornelius. And Cornelius was a, an Italian, a Roman soldier. And he was a, what's called a centurion. That means he would have a hundred soldiers under, under him. But he was a God-fearer. So here in this text, we see these two men, Simon Peter, who is this this devout Jew who received Jesus Christ as the Messiah. He's a Messianic Jew. He is the chief apostle, the one whom Jesus himself had hand chosen and picked and had elevated him this place of stature. And to Peter, Jesus had said, I'm going to give you the keys to the kingdom. You will open the door of the kingdom of God under this dispensation of grace that we know is the church age and that Peter would bring in Jews on the day of Pentecost, Samarians in Acts chapter 8, and now God will use Peter to introduce these Gentile people to the Messiah, Jesus Christ. Are you following me? Now let's look at the second person, two men, Simon Peter, and the 
separate man, Cornelius. In the Bible there, he's referred to in uh, Acts chapter 10, verse uh, 1, as a centurion of the Italian regiment, he and his whole family. He was referred to as being a devout man, as a God-fearing man, as a man who gave alms or who gave generously to the poor, and as a man of prayer. So he's a spiritual man. He's a devout man, a God-fearing man, a generous man in terms of his deeds toward the poor, and he's also a man of prayer. Now look at what the Bible says there in the rest of verse 3. The one day while he was going through his routine of prayer, at about 3 o'clock in the afternoon, Cornelius has a vision. And in this vision, he sees this angel of God who calls him by name and says, Cornelius. And in fear and trepidation, he responds, what is it, Lord? And the angel answers him that your prayers and your alms and your gift to the poor have come up as a memorial offering before God. So now we see these two men, and we're going to see that both of these men have a vision. And we see first the vision of Cornelius, and Cornelius has a vision of an angel. And an angel comes to him and says that your prayers and your alms have appeared before the throne of God as a memorial, as a testimony to God. That should be encouragement to all of us in here this morning. That the things that we do secretly, the things that we do privately, the things that we do sincerely from our hearts as expressions of love to God, as worship that we're offering up to God, as praise we're offering up to God, our work that we do in the name of Jesus Christ to exalt his name and show his love to people they're sin to God, and they appear before him. And so this angel says to him, he says that your alms and your prayers, your good deeds and your prayers have appeared before God. Prayer is a wonderful thing, and we ought to do more of it. And it's a wonderful privilege that we have to talk to God and to intercede, intercessory prayer, to speak to God on behalf of someone else, to stand in the gap, if you would, and lift up someone else's need, someone else's burden, someone else's situation, and to bring them into the presence of God, that's a wonderful thing. But prayer is not a substitute for deeds. He says your prayers and your arms, your good deeds, and your prayers have a symbol before God. And if our prayers, our prayers that are really energized by the Holy Spirit, our prayer will lead us to deeds of service to other people in the name of Jesus Christ. So two visions, the one of Cornelius at his home. The second vision was a vision that Peter has. So in the vision of Cornelius, God instructs him specifically to send and to request a man by the name of Simon, who is also called Peter, who's a place called Joppa, stand with a man called Simon the Tanner, whose house is by the sea. So God gives some specific descriptive terms to locate Simon Peter. By name, by location, by address, and by house. So then Cornelius gets some of his men together, and he sends them to Simon the Tanner's house at Joppa to ask for Simon called Peter. And so while they're on their way to, to Joppa, to request Peter to come to visit Cornelius about noon on this day, the following day, as they were about their journey, Peter was praying. And while Peter was praying, Peter became hungry. When you and I pray, we get sleepy. <laughs> Thank you. So Peter becomes hungry while he's praying, but God can speak to us even when we are distracted. So Peter's distracted in his prayer by the hunger pains of his stomach, and so God speaks to him in the midst of this situation. And the Bible says in verse 11 of Acts 10 that the heavens open and descending from heaven on a large sheet, four corners, and it contained all kinds of four-footed animals and reptiles and crawling things and creeping things and so forth, birds. And the voice says, get up, Peter, kill and eat. And Peter says, I don't think so, Lord. This is saved, sanctified, filled with the Holy Ghost, Peter. 
He said, I, I don't think so, because I, I, don't, I don't just eat everybody's cookie. And I can't eat it every greasy spoon on the side of the road. He says, I, I don't think so, Lord, because that which is on that sheet is not on my menu. It's not a part of my dietary schedule. And so Peter goes on to say, I've never eaten any, in, anything impure or unclean. That is a powerful statement. That is a powerful statement. Peter says, as much as I know my own conscience, I have never eaten anything purposefully, intentionally, that would have been called unclean or unpure. I've never eaten anything that was off limits to a Jew to consume. Now, this is important. This is important because the Jews really didn't understand the dietary laws. They didn't understand why God placed all these restrictions upon them. They thought that they were special because they kept the strict dietary laws. They thought they were special because they observed the feast days and the holidays. They thought they were special because what they were doing or what they did. They were only special because God chose them. <laughs> they weren't special because they didn't do th certain things that other people did. They were special because God had chose them. And so God then gave them these dietary laws and gave, those all, gave them these uh, ceremonial feasts to observe, not because they were special in of themselves, because he was making them to be unique and to be different so that other people could see that they lived differently from the rest of the world. But they focused on what they were able to do themselves, and therefore they became spiritually arrogant. And they thought that by birth and by religious practice that they were spiritually superior to everybody that was not a Jew. And there were no more people on the planet any more powerful, any more arrogant than the Jewish nation. And they forgot what God had told them. He had tried to tell them in the Old Testament, don't forget when you were nobody, when you four parents were slaves down in Egypt, don't forget when you were the outscouring of the earth, I chose you. I selected you, and I brought you into the promised land. Don't you forget that. But they forgot it. And that's one of the marks of our own human fallenness, is that we forget what God has brought us from. And our assumption is that there is something that we have done in and of ourselves that makes us better than other people. We have a tendency to forget. And we should always be reminded but except by the grace of God, there goes me. Except by the grace of God, you and I this morning could be somewhere on Skid Row. We could be somewhere this morning in a drug rehab facility. We could be somewhere this morning in some prostitution house. We could be somewhere this morning under the bridge somewhere. It's not because we've been so smart or so wise. It's not because we've lived so well or so spiritually. It's only because of the grace of God. It's the God's hand upon our lives that has kept us from some things. Don't you know that even when you were growing up as a child, there were certain experiences that God allowed you to have, certain things you heard. There was a certain spiritual resilience that God put inside of you that kept you and I from doing certain things that we ought, ought, otherwise would have done. And so we don't want to forget. Now here's what I want you to see that Peter now is on the other side of the cross. He's accepted Christ. He's received the Holy Spirit. He's preaching the gospel and people are getting saved. But Peter still has a residual residue of his spiritual arrogance that he's brought over from his Jewish pride. Are you following me? And he doesn't even realize it. So the voice then speaks back to him the second time, do not call anything unpure that God has made clean. And then God does it a third time to emphasize it so that Peter really understands this really is God that's speaking to us and to me. So then the sheet disappears. Now while P Peter was pondering this, what does all of this mean? Why would God send down on the sheet all of these creatures and critters and tell me to slay and eat, knowing that I don't eat that type of stuff, what is the message inside of the vision that God has for me? While he's pondering that, someone raps on the door. And the men that Cornelius had dispatched, they show up in Joppa at Simon the Tanner's house. And they call for Simon Peter. 
And Peter now comes down to, to greet these men. And while he's thinking about this, the Spirit of God speaks to him and says, look, don't hesitate, Peter. You go with them because I've sent them. And so Peter now goes down to greet these men and ask them why they come. And then the narrative goes on. They tell him why they've come. They've sent by Cornelius. Now watch this. Two men, two visions, two testimonies. Now we know all about Peter's testimony, but look at Cornelius' testimony. The testimony that is given by the men that he sends to get Peter and describing him, they describe him in verse 22 of Acts 10 as a righteous man, as a God-fearing man, as one who's respected by all the Jewish people. So that's the testimony that he has to these men. And then they relay to Peter the fact that he's had this vision and that God, through the holy angel, has instructed him through this vision to go and get Peter. Now stay with me now because I want you to see one thing in this text that I think is going to be a blessing to you. So now we have these two men, two visions, two separate testimonies of Cornelius and Peter. So God brings them together. So now Peter, on the next day, he accompanied the men that Cornelius had sent to go back to Caesarea to, to, to uh, Cornelius' house. Verse 25 says, as Peter entered the house, Cornelius met him and fell at his feet in reverence, but Peter made him get up and said, stand up, he says, for I'm only a man myself. And talking with him, Peter went inside and found a large gathering of people. And he said to them, you are well aware that it's against our law for Jews to associate with Gentiles or to visit him. But God has shown me that I should not call any man impure or unclean. I want you to stop right there. Peter had still been holding on. He was holding on to the old pride and the spiritual arrogance that was associated with Judaism. So he goes in, and the first thing he does, he says, you know it's against my law for me to be here with you people. Because I'm not supposed to associate with you people. Because you people are spiritually beneath my people. But then he says something that's really powerful. He says something really powerful. He says that, but God has shown me that I should not call any man impure or unclean. Now here is what is profound about this and what we must understand. We must understand that the Bible is God's truth to us. And the Bible is the truth that God wanted to give to us in a bound as we have it now a canon of scripture. And the Bible gives us insight, it gives us revelation about Jesus Christ, it gives us insight about ourselves. And the Bible serves as a, as a guide to point us in the right direction. But it's the Holy Spirit that brings to us illumination. And the Holy Spirit brings revelation. And everything that God wants us to know, we don't know it yet. And everything that God wants us to understand, we don't understand it yet. Peter walked with Jesus Christ for three and a half years and was taught directly by Jesus himself. So he had a lot of insight that no one else on the planet has ever had. And now Peter is, is the primary spokesperson for the early church in terms of preaching the truth that Christ had taught them. But there is illumination and revelation that God reveals to us to bring us to a higher level of understanding about, our, about, about who we are and about what it is he wants us to do. Are you following me? That Peter didn't understand that he still was holding on to the prejudice from his past. But it was only through this event at Simon the Tanner's house on the housetop through the vision that came down to him that God forces him to deal with the prejudice that's still in his own heart for everybody who's not like him, who's not like him, who doesn't have the same culture orientation that he has or the same religious orientation that he has. And Peter says, now I get it. 
He says, now I really do understand that I'm not the judge of people's spirituality. Look at what he says. He says, now I understand, but God has shown me that I should not call any man impure or unclean. Peter says, now I now understand that I am not in a spiritual position to determine the state of somebody else's soul. Only God can do that. Only God really knows the conditions of a person's soul. Only God really knows where a person stands with him. He says that God has made me to understand that whatever criteria that I might use to come to some conclusion, that I could be off target. That's more powerful than you think. And then he goes on to say that I came without any objection. Two men, two visions from two paths, two separate experiences, two separate religious orientations. But now the Holy Spirit brings them together. Two testimonies that are different. But God brings them together so that they can see the centrality of the one message. And so then Cornelius now expounds again on his testimony to Peter as to why he sent for Peter. And look at what Peter concludes. In verse 32, Cornelius says that God instructed him to send to Joppa for Simon who's called Peter. He's a guest at the home of Simon the Tanner who lives by the sea. So I sent for you immediately, and it was good for you to come. Now we are here in the presence of God to listen to everything the Lord has commanded you to tell us. Then Peter began to speak. I now realize. It's powerful. Peter says, early he says, God now has made me to understand that I'm not qualified to call somebody unclear or impure. And Peter says, I now realize. You see, what I want you to see is that God is always in the business of revealing more insight, things that are, that are deeper and that are clearer if we're open to receive it. Based on Cornelius' testimony, God was actually teaching Peter through the testimony of, of Cornelius. So Peter came to a deeper understanding. He came to deeper revelation based on what God was doing in someone else's life. That's why we can learn from each other. We can learn things through what God is doing through the lives of other people because what God desires to do, he's not going to do it all in and through us, but we learn from each other. Peter says, I now realize how true it is that God does not show respect for person. That God does not show favoritism. That, that, that really is profound. We talk about the apostle Peter. And Peter says, I now realize this. He knew, it, what, he knew what the Bible said. He knew the Bible taught that God is not a respecter of person. He knew that in his head intelligently, but until he actually sees what God is actually doing, and without seeking anyone's approval, God moves in the life of the last person that Peter thought that God would move in, the lives of the Gentiles. But God accepts men from every nation who fear him and who do what is right. And then Peter then goes on there to share the gospel of Jesus Christ, the one simple message. The one simple message as he begins to recruit to recount the life of Christ and the ministry of Christ and the work of Christ and how Jesus went about doing good in verse 38 and the fact that they were witnesses, verse 39, and the fact that there was a conspiracy that killed him, verse 39b, and that God had raised him from the dead, verse 40, and that he was seen by some, verse 41, but not by everybody was he seen, and that they were chosen to be his witnesses and those who would live and walk with him. And he commanded them to preach to people and to testify that he's the one, the true living God, the appointed one. And all the Bible spoke to that. So what God does is take two men, two visions, two testimonies from two different backgrounds. He brings them together where they can see there's but one message of salvation. 
There's one message of salvation. And this passage becomes so important to the New Testament church because we see here in Acts chapter 10 that God brings in the non-Jewish people. He brings in the God-fearers, those who really sought God with their hearts, who desire to know God. God brings them to saving faith and his son, the Lord Jesus Christ, based on their willingness to turn to Christ and call on him, and it was not necessary for them to become Jews. This is more important to us than what we realize. And we're going to see that this whole issue still doesn't get resolved here. But it's so important because it was Peter, the leader of the apostles, who God uses to take the message of the gospel to this Gentile man, Cornelius. And then the last thing I want you to see is look again at verse 44. While Peter was still speaking the words about Christ, the words about the gospel, the testimony of the prophets, the message of forgiveness and remission of sins, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, while he was still speaking these words, the Holy Spirit came on all who heard the message. And so what God does here with Peter, he shows Peter, it is the power is in the message that is preached and that is known it by the Holy Spirit. So while he's still talking, before he even gave an invitation, God sovereignly fell on these people, and they received the Holy Spirit the same way that Peter and the other apostles and disciples had received the Holy Spirit in Acts chapter 2. That was important. Because God is now confirming here, I'm no respecter of persons, that those non-Jewish Christians, they're not going to be second-class Christians. They're not going to come in as second-class folk because they weren't there on the day of Pentecost or because they had not practiced the law of Moses. No, the salvation is to all who call on the name of the Lord. And there's but one message of salvation. There's but one Lord and there's but one faith. And there's but one way to get to heaven. It's through faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. And that becomes important for the history of the church. And so the message falls, is preached, and the Holy Spirit falls upon them. And they have the same experience that the other uh, disciples had had on the day of Pentecost. So that they can see there's but one Lord and one faith and one baptism and there's be one body. And this was so powerful to Peter that Peter says there in verse 46b, then Peter said, verse 47, can anyone keep these people from being baptized with water? They received the Holy Spirit just as we believe, we have. So he ordered that they be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ, and they asked Peter to stay with them for a few days. Well, this will be, you'll see how important this is as we progress through the book of Acts. This scene here is of paramount importance for the church because it establishes that non-Jewish people are brought into the body of Christ, they're brought into the church through faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, apart from any adherence to the Old Testament law. And they're brought in as equal citizens and have an equal standing in the church. Are you following me? Let me close with just a few, few points for you to ponder, and then we'll look at the Lord's table. A couple lessons. The first lessons I see in this text that we learn is that we never know as much about God as we think. We never know as much as we think. Peter had been with him for three and a half years. Peter had preached the most powerful sermons that had been preached and thousands that came to faith in Christ at his preachings. Peter had heard about all of the parables and the interpretations of the parables, but there were still things about God that people, Peter didn't know. And he didn't really understand the magnitude of the grace of God. He didn't understand how magnanimous, how stupendous, how awe-inspiring the grace of God really and truly was. That there was no one that he could imagine that could be too far from the saving grace of God. Even these Gentile dogs that they despise could be saved and could have their sins forgiven and remitted if they simply put their faith in Jesus Christ. We never know as much about God as we think. Second thing we learn from Peter is that we have prejudices and biases that we don't even realize. Peter didn't realize that he was still a religious bigot. 
He didn't realize that he was still prejudiced toward non-Jewish people. He did not realize that he did not view everyone as his equal, only Jews. And our cultural orientation, our religious orientation, our social orientation, and the way we have been socialized, and we don't even realize that there are times we're holding on to biases and prejudices, and only the Spirit of God can shine his spotlight into our hearts and bring us into situations to where we have to deal with it and so we can deal with it. Are y'all listening to me? Now, let me tell you something here. I want you to do something. I want you to keep following this Megan Williams situation because this situation is going to force us in the state of West Virginia and hopefully the church to deal with things that we don't want to deal with. We keep trying to not really deal with it, and it keeps taking on a life of its own. Now you got the state attorney general and the Logan County prosecuting attorney pontificating and sparring in the newspaper with this hot potato. You need to read these newspaper articles, and then you can see behind some things that's really going on. Nobody wants to deal with this situation and force it to be dealt with openly so the public can be a part of the conversation and discourse. Are you listening to me? Now, I'm not trying to stir anything up. It's already been stirred up. So it's back on the front page two days in a row as these Politicians now try to posture themselves to try to exonerate themselves from any type of guilt or culpability or failing to discharge their responsibilities. But the issue is, are we prepared as a church to deal with the truth of what the truth might be so that we can bring about forgiveness, reconciliation, and healing so we can move on in the name of of the Lord. I'm talking about the church. I'm not talking about politicians, the people out in the street, in the neighborhood, in community. They're going to act crazy all the time. But as a church, read this. Pray about this. There's going to be a unique opportunity for the church to weigh into this situation and try to bring to bear some sense so that we don't get hung up on this thing. This thing can result. You think we got embarrassed by getting beat by Pitt 13 to 9. You wait to see, see in, uh, M -N, uh, M -N, uh, NBC and and all these talking heads come in here to deal with this thing. And they start peeling back stuff. We'll be the laughing stock of the entire United States of America before this thing is over with. And you mark my word, that's exactly what's going to happen. That's exactly what's going to happen. And we're going to look like a bunch of buffoons. Our whole legal system will look like a bunch of nuts, a bunch of insane, incompetent people. And the public is going to look like they're so uninformed to where they can't hold people accountable to do the right thing. You think this newspaper article this guy wrote, this sports columnist wrote about we marrying our sisters and our cousins and we all barefoot and crazy. You think that was embarrassing and humiliating. You wait till they start pulling back this thing. Number three, God will reveal new truth to us if we are obedient. And open. He's not going to give us more Bible. We got all the Bible we need, but God will reveal new truth to us. Peter was open to new revelation, to a deeper understanding about the grace of God, to a deeper understanding of what God was really doing. So our understanding from God, it will stop when our curiosity stops. When we stop being curious about wanting to know more about God, to understanding more about the grace of God, to understanding more about the depth of the love and the mercy of God, then our spiritual growth can stop. But if we are open to truth, God will take, her, take us deeper into his truth. And God will show us things as he showed Peter. Peter said, oh, now I understand that God is no respecter of person. Now I understand that God will respond to anyone who calls on him by saving grace. Peter's own mind was limiting him to what God could do through his ministry when he limited to the fact that God could only save people like me. And the last thing that I want you to ponder is something Peter said, that God truly is no respect of person. God truly is an equal opportunity savior. It really is whosoever will, let him come. 
It really is that let the tired and the weak and the broken and the heavy laden and the broken in spirit and the despised and the rejected, if they'll turn away from their own wicked way and cry out to the Lord, Lord, have mercy on me, a sinner. God will not despise. He will not reject. And God doesn't put all the prerequisites and all the qualifications and all of the things that we put on folks so minds can come to Christ. They can come just as they are in humble, broken submission, saying, Lord, have mercy on me, a sinner, and God will save him. He really is no respect of persons. And that should stir our hearts and excite us and motivate us to want to share this message and tell others about a, a, a Christ that can save and a God that will save. Regardless of how you were born or how you came into the world or regardless of how you live and what you have or what you don't have, if you realize I'm undone, if you realize I want to be better, I want to know God, I want to be saved, Jesus Christ will save you. He really is no respecter of persons. Let's bow for prayer, shall we? Father, we thank you. We thank you, Lord, and we praise your holy name that you're revealing more about yourself to us as we seek you in the study of your word and in prayer and meditation and service and fellowship. We see your hand of mercy. And we thank you, Lord. And Father, help us just to be vessels Containers to carry your word and your love and your mercy and your grace so that you can pour it out upon other folk and so they can see the good hand of God. If it pleases you this morning, Father, to open the heart of some man or woman, boy or girl, some person today who's come into this building with a heavy heart, and with a broken spirit, realizing they need to be saved. Pray if you'd open their heart, Lord, right now. Give them space to accept you by faith, to receive you by faith, to believe that you indeed love them and you will save them if they would just turn to you and ask you to come into their hearts and save them in Jesus' name. You ever hear, I, bowed every eye closed, but there's one in this morning, you just want to be saved. You want your sins to be forgiven. You like Cornelius, you're just a God-fearer, you just want to know the Lord. Now is the day of salvation. This is your opportunity to be saved. Right where you are, if you just will say to the Lord, Lord, I know that I am a sinner. I know that I have fallen short. I know that I've not kept your word. I've not done all the things you told me to do. And I've, never, I've not done all the things I knew were right to do. But I believe that you love me. And I believe that you died on the cross for me and that you shed my, your blood for me. And you raised from the dead on the third day. I put my faith in you, Lord. I put my trust in you for salvation. Come into my life, Lord Jesus. If you pray that simple prayer, won't you raise your hand right where you are? And let someone come and talk with you and pray with you and show you from God's word the promise of God. The promise of God to save anyone who calls upon his name. Is there one here today you just want to be saved? You want to be forgiven. You want to be right with God. You want the guilt and the shame and just take it away. And you want to know that things are right between you and God. Is there one here today? Maybe you're already saved and you sense a need to rededicate and recommit your life to Christ. Why don't you do it today? If you're looking for a church home, look no further. Drop an anchor here and come and, and work from this particular venue in the name of Jesus. While the choir sings, the doors of the church is open, the invitation is extended. Whosoever will, let him come and let her come. And drink from the water of life freely. Now is the time. Today is the day of salvation. Is there someone here today that wants to be saved? Is there a Cornelius in the house?